Uh, this Christmas season, I think it's the, the time when um, one of the most used words, most often used words, is the word gift. Did you give gifts? Have you given gifts to your family? Did you receive gifts? Uh, let's go buy gifts. Let's give uh, gifts everywhere. The word gift, you made, you made it. And uh, this is beautiful. This is good that uh, uh, at least once a year, sometimes uh, even more than that, uh, we can remember the beloved ones and then just make a little sign and tell them that they matter, they count for us. But um, let's turn tonight to a history that uh, would throw a light upon the nature of the true gift that we all receive. Not only that, but the true giving of gifts. So our topic tonight is gift and giver. It's possible that um, uh, when you give a gift, you don't give yourself as a gift in the same time. You just give it, your gift away and that's all. That is not a gift. Like a parent that would give to his children um, food and clothing and shelter and everything, but that's all. They, they need more than that. They need the gift of presence. They need the gift of, the gift of love. They need to understand that that gift is accompanied and, and it's an expression not of a commercial situation, but it's an expression of, the, of what the person feels for them. Then the gift is extremely valuable. Even if it is a poor gift or doesn't matter, but if, it, uh, if it's understood that it comes out of love, then it is priceless, literally. You keep it, you remember it. It's forever. While uh, you can receive a gift, uh, let's say very precious somehow, very expensive, better said, very expensive, but which is not a company accompanied or does not come out of your love for the person, but it's offered in coldness, in indifference, like passing by a beggar and just throwing your coin there. He would treasure more a look from you than a coin. I am sure about that. He would remember out of 1,000 people that gave him one coin when they passed, he would remember at the end of the day about that person that giving the coin looked at him, in, uh, looked and, uh, at him and then said hi or just uh, sent a simple smile. He will remember that out of 1,000 people that, that just uh, passed by. I'd love to open in, the, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. And the word of God in this place says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, the word indescribable means that we don't need to make any effort to try to describe what you can, we can say tonight is that the Lord gave us the gift that is beyond description, beyond human words, and beyond human understanding. We get the message, but we don't get the full content of the gift of God. And when we talk about the gift of God, we don't talk about things. We talk about God giving himself as a gift for us. This is the most precious gift ever offered. And it speaks of God in more powerful words than the whole history of the entire universe with all constellations and, and all systems and all cosmos together. This indescribable gift speaks better, louder, more powerful than anything else. And it will speak forever. Let's just come together in a place where uh, gifts were offered when Jesus was born. And the book of Matthew chapter 2, and here verse 10, the word says, uh, when they saw the star, it's about the Magi, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then, 
they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of mirth. It's remarkable that they did not just come and uh, gave them some help because they had a newborn baby and they needed help for their traveling or for their necessities in that specific condition there. No, first of all, they bowed down and they worshiped him. To worship means not to make any gymnastics of signs or say words, understood or not understood. To worship means to give yourself to God. That's the only acceptable worship, the only spiritual ministry that, you, uh, that a person can do. Like in Romans chapter 12, the Bible says give yourself give your whole being to God, that is a spiritual ministry. That is your spirituality. Not doing things for God, not offering things to God, but offering yourself. So the, the gift of the Magi was accepted by God because it was preceded by their worshiping him first. And then the Bible says, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and mirth. Then, it, it's, it's an order. If somebody would offer God whatever on earth, like 1 Corinthian, Corinthians chapter 13 says, even if I would give all my fortune, if I would give everything I have, but I don't have charity or love, it's in vain. If I would speak like a prophet, if I would know all the science in the way, if I would do all the miracles under heaven for God, and I would not love God, that would be nothing. They first bowed down and worshipped themselves to God. Then they opened their treasures, and their gifts were accepted only because they gave themselves first to God. So this is what is asked from us. But of course, a lot of uh, hindrances and, and a lot of thoughts come to mind when we think that, oh, am I that person? Is God interested in a person like me? Uh, do I have the gifts, the right gifts to offer to God? And the only gift God is asking from us is just our heart. He says, my son, give me your heart. And he does not qualify the word heart. It just leaves this it as is. He doesn't say, give me your bad heart or give me your good heart or your beautiful heart or your ugly heart. No. No qualification for the word. Just the word. Give me your heart as a present. And then, with that, you can offer God the gifts that you received from him. In John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus talks to the woman at the well. And there, he tells her about himself in a very simple word, that he is the gift of God. And he's telling her, if you knew the gift of God, and who is that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift of God. And uh, if Jesus would address this question to us, do you know the gift of God for you? What is the most important gift from God that you received? Some people maybe would count their riches or their talents or their power or their fame or their physical features or whatever else on earth. They would think that's the gift. No, those are the gifts. But the gift the great gift of God, the gift that God gave to humanity and to every single person is the person of his son, Christ Jesus. That is the gift of God. And if you knew that the gift of God, and who is it that asks you for a drink? You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It is extremely important to know and to understand the gift of God in the person of Christ. Because only if you understand this, only if you accept the gift of God, then you ask him 
and he would give you living water. But if you don't believe in the gift of God, and if you don't accept the gift of God, you are never going to ask for living water. If you were not faithful in accepting the greatest of all gifts, how do you think you will be faithful in accepting other gifts from God? This is a very troubling and puzzling question. Because we are very easy to accept material gifts, health, or uh, success in life, or whatever gifts life offers us. We're so, so ready to accept it, even eager to. But when it's about the gift of God, the gift of God, the person of Christ, then we start thinking, should I accept this gift or not? About the others, do you want money? Oh, yeah, we, God d doesn't even finish his words. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, give me as much, as much as possible. Do you want to have power as much as possible? Do you want to have fame the, for the whole world? Miss Universe, if possible, in the entire universe, have fame to be famous there. But when it's about the gift of the Son of God, all of a sudden, oh, oh you start pondering, should I accept this gift or not? This tells us something that our nature is filled with enmity against God almost naturally and naturally. It is so ready to accept whatever gift but is so slow in accepting the gift of life in Christ Jesus. If you, would, if you knew the gift of God then you would ask why don't we pray? Why don't we ask? Why don't we believe? It is because we do not know the gift of God. That's the real problem. When we understand the gift of God, then Paul says, if you really accept the gift of God, then you start thinking, if God gave me what was most precious to him, how can I, how dare I doubting that he will give me the other secondary things that is life or whatever else when he, when he gave me what was most important? That's why Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. It is very easy to give when it's about things you possess or you have. It's easy to give. For some people, for some it's difficult. But for some people, for most of us, it is easy to give what you have. Sometimes you are ready to give what you even don't have, but you give it anyway. But it is extremely difficult when it's about giving yourself. There is a lot of resistance in ourselves in giving us as a gift back to God, our lives as they are. Paul speaks in Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin, you know, there we are very ready to offer them to sin, almost naturally. A child um, knows, how, uh, knows to lie without learning. He doesn't need to learn that. He knows the science by heart. And uh, uh, he is ready to steal from another child. He is ready to grab and, and have everything for himself or for herself, naturally. He doesn't need to go to any school to do that. But it's going to be very, very difficult when it is about teaching him how to offer. And it's going to be the most difficult when he will be taught by God to offer himself or herself. That's the real challenge of life. But Paul says, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Well, if you were dead and he raised you from the dead, what would keep you today to offer your life that was brought back to life from death? You were rotting like Lazarus in the fourth day in his tomb and he raised you from there. Uh, what would keep you, what would prevent you from offering yourself to him until you a debtor to the one that brought you from death to life. Just think of a person that saved your life. Just think on that person. Just think of a person that literally gave his life in order to save your life. Either in an accident or in a, 
uh, in a situation like many times it happened. People uh, trying to save other people and dying in the process. Saving them, but the one trying to save dying. And then you remember for the rest of your life and you say in every occasion, I am alive today because of that person in that time at that moment. I was just reading that during the Civil War, a man by the name of George Watt was drawn by lot to go to the front. He had a wife and six children. A young man named Richard Pratt offered to go in his stead. The young man came and said, Mr. George, I know you have six kids. I know your wife, I know your family. I'm alone. So I know it's life and death situation, but I'm going to risk my life for you. I want to go for you. It was a law at that time, and I don't know if it is still on at this time, but it was a law that a person could offer himself or herself to go instead of another person. And this young man, Richard Pratt, offered himself to go for Mr. George Watt. And then uh, it says that um, he was accepted and joined the ranks, bearing the name and number of George Watt. Before long, Pratt, the young man that offered himself, before long, Pratt was killed in action. The authorities later sought again to draft George Watt into the service. He protested, entering the plea that he had died in the person of Pratt. He insisted that the authorities consult their own records and to the fact of, him, of his having died in identification with Pratt, his substitute. Watt was thereby exempted as beyond the claims of law and for the service. He died in the person of his representative. There we have the truth of identification in a nutshell. God's way of deliverance is through death. Through identification with our substitute in his death and resurrection. This is the gift. The young man came and said, Mr. George, I offer my life for your life. Please stay home with your family. Please save your life and care for your family. But the man could have been too proud and say, oh, well, uh, I think you are a young man, and uh, I, I think I'll do it myself. You can reject even the gift of life. Pride is so dangerous that it literally interferes between you and the gift of God. If there is a reason for a person to reject the gift of God, which is Christ Jesus, this reason is pride. You wouldn't believe, close to uh, Los Angeles, a lady fell off a bridge with her car and literally got hung of her rear bumper and was dangling under the bridge. And she was inside the car. And the fireman trucks came there and the police and everybody on helicopters were there. As soon as they were coming close, of course they anchored the car right away. Uh, and the, now they were trying to, to take her out of the car. But every time they were coming close, she said, no, stay away. I will do it myself for me. I will, do it for, I will do it myself. It took a long time to convince that lady to accept the gift of salvation that was offered to her. She was so proud, she said, I will do it myself. How can you do that in those conditions? Or even if that lady could have done that when it's about life and death, when it's about the eternal death, when it's about the sin problem, there is no way of escape for the human being. All is lost, upstart. That's why Romans chapter 6 says, Do not offer your body, your parts, the parts of your body to sin. Offer them to God because you were dead and you, you have been brought from death to life. And uh, he speaks in 2 Corinthians 8 5 about some people that made some contribution to help the, help the word of God. And they did not do as, they, as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. This is the godly order. First of all, they gave themselves to the Lord 
and then to us in keeping with God's will. Well, uh, it was um, a situation well known all over the world, especially in the Christian world I'm talking, uh, where some people came around Jesus and they tempted him, asking him if, if it was lawful to pay tax to Caesar or not. And uh, uh, I suppose most of us, they, we know the story. Uh, Jesus took a coin and um, he said they, they brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose portrait is this? It was the portrait of, the, of Caesar imprinted on the coin. And then, and whose inscription is here? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. How does this apply to all of us? Well, there are things that have the Caesar's portrait imprinted. They need to go there because the Caesar's portrait is there. That thing belongs to Caesar. And there is the inscription of Caesar. It's right there. It needs to go to him because his inscription is there. But the human being, it bears two things. The image of God, the portrait of God, and the inscription of the law of God in his or her heart. So Jesus said, uh, whose portrait is there, to that one, this one belongs. So if you wonder, to whom do I belong? Just remember that you've been created in the image of God. And Jesus says, if something bears a certain image, that should go to the person to whom the, the image belongs. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That means the, the things of this earth. That means things pertaining to this life, social relationships, or whatever else. But when it is about your heart, when it is about your worshiping, when it is about devotion, those, give them to God. Because you are made in the image of God, and you have the inscription of God in your heart. This is the reason to offer yourself to God. But we live in a society today that says that we need to give the Caesars what belongs to God. That means uh, worshiping man. And then you need to give the church what belongs to Caesars. That means money. Every single sermon you hear appeals for money, 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 more money, millions, billions with the church. That's most important. If a person gives money to the church, it's, is that a faithful man? Well, the Bible has a different standard for that. It says, if a person gives God, the image of God, and the inscription of God, that person belongs to God. And if the person gives to Caesars what belongs to Caesars, that's a, that's a faithful man. It is not easy to accept the gift of God. And I am sure each and every one of us, uh, we have a reason for saying to the Lord, no, not now, not this way, not here. I am sure that Satan um, makes us think that we are not worthy of offering ourselves as a gift to God, which is true. But God did not ask for worthy gifts. He said, give me the gift of your heart. That's all I'm asking from you. Give me your life because the image of God is there. And the inscription of God is there. And let it with me. If it is incomplete or imperfect or whatever as is I'm talking, let it with me and I will work on it. So today, it's time for us to ponder in this time of gifts, people giving gifts, people receiving gifts, people receiving from God and never returning. It's time for us to ponder and to think, have I offered myself to God? Have I offered my heart to him? Is he supreme for me? Is he the one that dwells in my thoughts, that fills my word, my feelings, my plans? My utmost in life, is he the one? Do I submit to him first? Do I take into account his will first? Is he the one to whom I committed my life? This is the troubling question. 
Well, many people will come in the day of judgment and they will remind God that they gave him a lot of things. God, we gave you, we prophesied in your name, we made miracles in your name, we exorcised demons in your name, and nothing else. Where was your heart? Where was your allegiance? I never asked you to give me exercising or prophesizing or making miracles or giving the, the, the whole things, all things you have for the poor or giving your own body to be burned as a martyr. I never asked for that. I asked for your heart to be given to God because it was twice bought by creation and by redemption. That's the one. They cannot say that. They cannot say, Lord, you gave us the gift of heaven in order to be saved. And we gave to you our lives as a gift. They cannot say that. They can say what they gave to God in their actions, in their gifts, and whatever else. But they cannot say that they gave their lives to God. Because the Bible says, the one that comes to me, it will never be rejected. I will never send him away. If somebody comes to me, and again, there is no qualification about this word, come unto me. It just says, as you are, where you are right now, the way you are right now, as you are. Well, uh, it's going to be a shocking surprise in the day when we, let's suppose some of the, of the relatives of the thief on the cross, they will be saved. And, um, well, they will be in the kingdom of God, uh, in the new body, and uh, having eternal life like the life of God. And guess what? Surprise of all surprises. They see there their thief relative, you know, the one that died on the cross that was put to death because of his lawlessness. All of a sudden, they see them there. And they will, the first words they will say, we thought you were in hell. We were so sure you were in hell. We didn't even ask about you because we were sure you were in hell. What happened? And he's going to say, it would have been like that. Except for the fact that I accepted the gift of God in the person of Christ. And I made this simple prayer. Remember me when you will come in your kingdom. And he promised, yes, that's why I'm here. God help us to have the same experience, all of us. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, your gift is indescribable. We don't try to do that. The gift of God that brings life to man. The gift of God, that's in, it's an expression of the love of God for us. For God so loved the world that he gave us the gift of the person of his son. Oh Lord, but our nature is evil. It rejects the gifts. It rejects the gift of God. Touch us, please. Open our eyes. Give us the power to accept the gift of God, the gift of life in Christ Jesus. And help us, precious Lord, to return to God what belongs to God, and that is our lives, with the portrait of God and with the inscription of God. We belong to you. So please accept our lives tonight as the gift offered in humility, as the gift that is ready to be offered as an expression of our weak love for you. And bring soon the day when we'll see face to face the gift of God, which is the expression of the love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.